Welcome to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello, and uh, I'm joined with uh, my good friend and um, local sailing buddy. Uh, only one of us has any boats, uh, Dr. Stuart Ballantyne. Stuart, nice to sit down with you again. Nice to meet with you again, Dave, in these strange times. It is. We, we can't meet and chat in a coffee shop anymore, so mm. we get takeaway. We sit two meters apart from each other. Yes. And um, we drink the takeaway. We drink the takeaway. It's wonderful, but the, 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 the part that concerns me is that the place is gone, is going to hell in a handbasket. And my wife, uh, she saw that I was going through uh, boarding pass withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> and uh, so she decided that she would um, take me to a shopping center. Now, I've never been shopping with my wife before. How ever. long have you been married? Only 30 odd years ago. And you've that. never been shopping with your wife before? No, have you? <laughs> <laughs> do you do this? I have been shopping with my wife before. Oh dear, this was a new experience and it was terrible because she wandered aimlessly around this huge place called Pacific Bear or upstairs, downstairs. But to me, it seemed like a small, a small city full of shops geared for women. It was <laughs> women's shoes, women's dresses, and a woman's fashion and wow there was not a marine shop anywhere <laughs> <laughs> terrible <laughs> then you're not a man unless it's a marine <laughs> audience right uh, marine merchandise and then she parked me she parked me beside a four old grumpy old guys uh, in a sort of loungy area and <laughs> while she went off to the last shop and the guy next to me kept asking me if i'd seen santa yet you know, and I thought, oh. Santa Claus. Yeah, I thought, oh, this is a bit special. I said, no, I haven't seen him. Not so far, but uh, I'll keep my eye out for him. <laughs> so I'm staying away from that. I'm, I don't mention boarding passes anymore to my wife. But How was, many people were there? Uh, there was quite a few. That was about seven days ago. So okay. it was quite a few, but it was not before, quieter than normal. Before lockdown. Before lockdown, this. Um, but my concern is just perspective. Don't yeah. you think we've lost a bit of perspective? It, it seems, it's hard to know. Like, uh, is, is um, are we going to be risking an awful lot? Because there's a, a high infection rate. Well, yeah. I was listening to one commentator yesterday and he was saying the actual infection rate isn't even known because we don't know, how, there's no, um, what do they call, uh, antibody test. So we yeah. don't know how many people have had it and recovered maybe even without symptoms. Oh. Um, so the, the report is that the infection rate is very, very high. The alarm and, and the reporting, the commentary around it is, yeah. is that the infection rate is astronomically high and we can't risk anything. Mm. However, the reality is that we don't know the infection rate. There's That's no way correct. to know it. That's correct. Well, I'm just a dumb sailor. I was at sea for seven years um, as a cadet and then uh, three years as a navigator before I came ashore and then studied the ship design. The, the part that concerns me about this coronavirus and the lockdown and everything else is when you put people out of work, they actually, they lose it. And when I was at sea uh, as a cadet going up to Nauru, if, if we arrived there when the westerlies were on, we had a crew of 81 on this ship and we had 48 mm -hmm. passengers. Uh, uh, and the westerlies were on, we had to drift. It was too deep to anchor, we just had to drift. And within wow. three days of doing nothing, and this is with a crew all on full wages, they started to lose it. They started to fight and get angry and everything else. And, and to me, it was a, an interesting phenomenon because I was working and living with these guys and I just couldn't believe that they were losing it. And as a cadet, you're like the lowest rank possible on the ship, is that right? Uh, well, no, yes, probably the lowest. Uh, my my uh, commands were anything that didn't move, I had to paint it, and anything that did move, I had to salute it. It was pretty... Simple, you know, we were lower than the basic weight, <laughs> sort of. But, yeah. but it was an interesting observation of, <laughs> about uh, people's behavior. And, and uh, years later, I, when I left the sea and I was studying naval architecture in Glasgow, I was driving a taxi part time to keep, keep myself afloat. Mm -hmm. And uh, only at weekends, I was studying during the day and driving a taxi at weekends. But Ted Heath, the, the UK Prime Minister, closed the Upper Clyde shipyards and Tens of thousands of guys were out of work immediately. Now, what happened immediately? Tens of thousands? Yes. And it was just, uh, I mean, the official number was around about 10,000, but all the support industries and like wow. everything. But what immediately happened, and it, it, it was amazing to me about the 
the speed of uh, how it happened. Domestic violence went up, home invasions, robberies, carjacking, everything. It just went to custard within a week. It was mm. just terrible. And they were on a social network, you know, with, with, on the dole. Yeah. But it's, they still uh, lost it. But there's an old Scottish saying, when poverty comes in the door, love flies out the window. Wow. You know, my mm. old Scottish sayings are very important. Um, very wise so, people, the Scots. <laughs> oh, yes. We cre created everything. Whiskey, fishing, golf, you name it. And Dolly the sheep. But, uh, <laughs> the, but the fact is that to human behavior, and I thought, wow, you know, the, the consequence of people being idle. So that was number two. Number three, I was caught with uh, Paul Keating's recession we had to have when the banks pulled in my overdraft, which was on a 22% rate at the time. Mm. And like a lot of people in Australia, we went bust. And then I saw the other consequences of people getting laid off. Two of my friends, quite close friends, suicided, which really alarmed me, distressed me, because mm. I didn't know they were going to do it or, or else I would have been saying, hey, listen, don't do this, you know. Mm. Uh, but uh, again, it was domestic violence went up, robberies and everything else, so, so home invasions, it was just terrible. So that to me was, okay, another tick in the box, you know, don't lay people off. I was in Venezuela three years ago when uh, Nicolas Maduro is tanking the economy mm -hmm. and there are millions of people out of a job. The, the, the bolivars, the local currency, is worth nothing. It's worth absolutely nothing. It's monopoly money. And for all you people that uh, live in, or that live in uh, Victoria, this is what uh, Daniel Andrews is, is doing to the Victorian economy. Mm. The socialism just doesn't work. But anyway, when I saw there, in the middle of the day, open kidnappings of anyone that looked a little bit uh, middle class or upper class, or they, they were, everything was desperado stuff. Um, uh, and millions actually left the country, went across to Colombia and the other states. So that's what happens when you put a lot of people out of work. So in this particular case where we said, okay, well, hang on, there's a virus come, I'd like to keep perspective. And do you know how many people die a day in Australia? Every day? I don't. 450. Wow, yeah. Of all sorts of things. 450 a day. So you think, well, hang on, that's not too bad. So roughly about 160,000 a year. Now there's, um, and in the flu, there's 10 people a day die of the flu. So when people say to me, well, okay, we're going to shut down the whole economy because they've got a virus, uh, I think it's claimed about 13 in the nation or something like that at the moment, but should we shut down the economy? Now, I'm just a simple sailor. I would say no. You don't, uh, the, I would certainly try and <coughs> isolate them. If I was coming back to my ship's captain, if I was the captain of a ship, and uh, I had 81 crew, like my, I did my cadet, 48 passengers, and the ship's medical guy said, oh, there's a virus on board, and it's likely to attack the elderly and the people that have got respiratory problems. So, okay, immediately, phew, isolate them, and make sure that no one else is, uh, is going to get, totally isolate them, because they're the vulnerable ones, and anyone that appears sick, they join the the isolation, but keep the ship going. Oh, but the medical officer wants you to stop because all of the other ships, like that ship over there, the New Zealand ship and the, the Italian ship and everything else, they've all stopped. And I'd be saying as a captain, no, I don't want to sit here and drift around aimlessly and destroy the economic basis of the ship, which is the fuel, the, the uh, stores, and the fact that we're taking cargo from A to B. Mm. You know, that's why we're here. Yep. So I don't want to do that. So I'll keep the ship going. Oh, no, but everyone else is doing that. Well, if I was the, the ship's captain, nobody arrives by helicopter. We stop all the F people coming in. We stop all the uh, people coming alongside in any boats and coming. But we isolate the ship. But we keep going. We don't stop the economy. Yep. Because I know from my previous experience, people get very toy and households and the social fabric collapses. I believe it might have been um, Sally McManus, the Australian Council of Trade Unions um, director or president um, spokesperson, um, 
and if not her, it was somebody else that I've heard recently. And essentially, there's this leftist narrative building that if you care for people, then you shut down everything. We go into complete lockdown. Everybody stays home. You're not allowed to leave. You're not allowed to do anything except bare minimum essentials, such as go to the doctor and go get food from the shops. Um, but you're not allowed to live, not allowed to have a life, not allowed to leave your home for any reason at all because you care for people. And they are comparing that option to the alleged um, care for money mm. of, of prioritising or, or having due regard for the economic impacts of such a shutdown. And, and the experiment I heard this person, it may have been Sally or somebody else, um, was saying, we ha now have an experiment. We're either going to see if what Trump does works, because apparently he's wanting the economy going again by Easter um, and, and promising that the economy has to be a important consideration. Mm. Um, or you, we have, on the other hand, Jacinda Ardern's um, socialist state of New Zealand, where you've got exactly what they're calling for, complete shutdown and total isolation uh, to the extreme. Well, that's, that's the part that concerns me. We have to keep perspective. And if we're losing 450 Australians a day, that's our average for the last 10 years. Or from other like, concerns. From, from other, other concerns. All other health reasons. Old age, cancer, there are all sorts of things. Which that so, number, by the way, would exclude abortions. They don't even count that. <laughs> that's right. So that's another story. But <laughs> it is another that's story. Over. But if you say, well, An okay, we're, lo lo we're losing 450, but to the flu, and here's now a new variety of the flu coming in. Now, if we're losing 10 people by the flu every day, and this... Uh, exceeded uh, 10 a day, I would say, well, now we've got a problem, okay? So we have to go into more of a lockdown. But at the moment, I don't see any sense in closing down the economy because we are creating such a burden for our kids and our grandkids. I mean, and I don't care if they lock away the old people. I am one of the old people, but I would rather do that and uh, make sure that my kids and my grandkids don't inherit such a huge pile of debt, mm. you know? And just because New Zealand's doing this and Italy's doing that and so and so is doing that, doesn't mean that we have to follow suit. You know, when I look at the <clears throat> uh, fearless leaders of SCOMO and the premiers, I mean, really, would you employ any of these people? I mean, I think SCOMO is not too bad. He's way ahead of what Shorten would be, but would you employ people like uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk? Would you employ Daniel Leonard? You wouldn't employ them. Even if you ran a milk bar, you wouldn't employ them. Mm. But should we be following all of the other countries or should we be making our own sensible rules and say, well, okay, we're going to cur curtail, stop people coming. We should be doing it. And again, an old Scottish saying, only dead fish go with the flow. Wow. I like that saying. Famous, you know. I've never heard that before, but I like it. But it's true. So just because everyone else is doing it, Australia shouldn't do it. Mm. And people say to me, oh, you're, you're a denier. Look, Looking around at all of the people that are leaders in the world, the only guy that's actually employed lots of people lots of times and is Donald Trump. And I, I, I think he's actually right. We have to find the balance. But Do you, you think don't... he's found the balance? Like, I'm actually really worried that we've lost perspective. And I'm not saying we have. Hear me loud and clear. I'm asking a question I don't know the answer to. I, I'm a free market kind of guy, but I'm also anti-generational debt um, and, I, and I think generational debt is generational theft yes um, and I think rather than passing the cost of this season on to our children and grandchildren we should do the hard yards we should understand this is going to hurt and if it's like war then so be it this is this is the cost of being alive in our age and we shouldn't make it because who knows what the future generations will have to pay. Yeah. Well, Why should they pay for their age plus ours? Sure, and I, I agree with that. But for instance, I think there's a lot of uh, over the top, close the borders. I mean, they haven't closed the borders between England and Scotland and England and Wales or each particular shire. And this nonsense, oh, we're gonna close the uh, New South Wales Queensland border because those evil people from down south are gonna come it in. It doesn't make a lot of sense when the virus is already on both sides. That's correct, it, you know, so I think they've lost perspective in that and I think that we need strong leadership. And we also need strong leadership in terms of, uh, we need positive talk and uh, positive action. 
And I believe that Scott Morrison, you know, as leader should be saying, hey guys, uh, it's already been pointed out by lots of people that $65 billion worth of projects have been, are being held up by green tape. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna roll back this green tape so that we get $65 billion worth of projects and that's happening today so the engineers mm. all working from home or whatever can start getting into it mm. and start projects moving because at the moment there is no leadership, there is no vision and where there is no vision, the people perish. Right. I'd like to say that was a Scottish saying, it's actually a, a biblical saying. <laughs> it was prob he was probably a, a Scottish Scots forebear. That's, that, 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 that's exa <laughs> exactly <Solid>. right. So <laughs> anyway, that's my five minutes worth and I know you, I think it's, uh, uh, people would probably disagree with both of us, but that's, that's my oh, take look, on. Uh, These are important discussions to have. Yes. Um, and I don't think we shouldn't be stimulating the economy. I just think we shouldn't be doing any measure that takes more than 20 years to pay off. Yes. Um, and, and I think if there's going to be recession or even depression, that is our responsibility. That is our burden to bear, not our burden to pass on. Um, well, you know the difference between recession and depression. Recession yeah. is when someone else is lose, loses their job. Depression is when you lose your job. <laughs> right. that's, that's the difference. <laughs> You know, just to look, end in a and and, a, and philosophically, part of my approach, part of look, there's a philosophical um, worldview which helps inform that, and that is, you know, I, I think we actually need a, a reset to what we value mm, as a probably. society. And I'm talking about um, commercialism and consumerism. Mm. We have an incredibly luxurious lifestyle. And we're unwilling to sacrifice that mm. for the sake of our children oh, and grandchildren. Absolutely. If we just live more simply, yep. and look, I know a thousand people are going to disagree with me now, but I actually strongly believe that our obsession with consumerism is driving us to have other people, especially government, raise our children for us mm, because right. every home needs two incomes. That's right, yeah. So I think, yeah, and no, I agree with you. And I think we just need, look, the cost of this age shouldn't be generational debt. It should be a simpler lifestyle. We're just going to not have to have as nice a car. I think people have learned that in the last two weeks. I think there's been a lot of people have, hey, just had a look around and said, hey, really, we're going to pull there's, our act together. There's a lot of people who are doing it tough at the moment who yes. are already poor. But I, and i not taking anything away from that at all, but they don't have as big an adjustment to make as the people who are on over $100,000 a mm. year um, who have now lost their jobs. Yes. They have a radical adjustment to make. Absolutely. Um, and I think as a society, we should make a radical adjustment, Absolutely. not pass it on to future generations. So uh, I guess what I'm advocating is that the capitalist response, I'm a capitalist, I just think it's another word for freedom, um, yeah. the, the capitalist response also needs some perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks a lot.